it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea Watson today. Um, uh, when I started working at the University of Chicago as a new assistant professor to form a new research group, I was not quite sure what to research, and this uncertainty lingered for quite some time. So when Andrea sent me her first email in February 2017 and said, I'm really interested in your research and wanted to meet me, I was uh, extremely happy since I was going to be talking with someone who perhaps could help me finally understand what our research was. And in fact, Andrea did help me find an answer to the question by joining our small band of confused people and by crafting from scratch one of the pillars uh, 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 that define the research portfolio of our group today. I want to mention that Andrea took on a remarkably difficult task and decided to investigate the determinants of microbial colonization in the human gut. The critical importance of addressing this challenge was obvious, but what would uh, have been the right direction to go for one to even start making progress towards any clarity into this question beyond model systems was much less clear. Finding a path in this wild terrain took a lot of um, uh, time and was only possible through the resilience and determination of Andrea. Thanks to our amazing collaborators in Canada who provided her with extraordinary poop samples, Andrea, with her fearless leadership, started deciphering tales of microbial ecology and evolution from complex data, eight resolutions that are rarely achieved in our field. In 2017, understanding the determinants of microbial colonization and resilience in the human gut represented one of the most daunting challenges to fully understand the diversity and role of the human microbiome in health and disease. And it still does. But during the next hour or so, I hope you will enjoy some snapshots from the path Andrea has paved. I am extremely proud of what Andrea has been able to accomplish throughout her journey in the science, and I look forward to her talk and her future endeavors. Andrea. Thank you so much, Marin, for that incredibly kind introduction. Um, one more thing before we begin is I actually just wanted to take a quick moment to commemorate a colleague of ours uh, who actually passed away the other week, Eric Littman, um, and offer my sincerest condolences to his family and his colleagues at the DFI and elsewhere. Today, I'm going to summarize some of the work that I've done throughout my PhD, which Marin alluded to. Um, my central aim has been to identify determinants of microbial colonization and resilience in the human gut. Here's a general outline of the schedule for this talk. Before we begin, I'd like to kindly ask you all to make sure that you're muted and also to save your questions until the end when we'll have lots of time for discussion. Sorry, one second, technical difficulty. Um, Okay, this will be fine. Um, to start with, I'm going to explain why microbes are one, cool, and two, important. So microbes were the very first life forms on Earth. Um, Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago, and only about a billion years later, photosynthetic bacteria appeared that could grow using energy from the sun. This wasn't the photosynthesis that you might normally think about, though, when you think about plants today. This was anoxygenic photosynthesis, where oxygen was not produced as a byproduct. In fact, oxygen was barely present in the atmosphere at all until another 700 million years went by, and the first oxygenic photosynthetic bacteria evolved. After 400 million more years of their diligent work, they finally began to increase the levels of oxygen in our atmosphere. In the next hundreds of millions of years, microbes started to do even wilder things like engulfing one another and making permanent hosts or permanent homes inside other microbial hosts. And this was actually the origin of the mitochondria, which we all use to produce our energy today, and chloroplasts, with which today's plants and algae use for photosynthesis. So with the evolution of the mitochondria and oxygen in the atmosphere, allowing for the oxidation of organic matter to generate energy, um, this paved the way for the evolution of larger life forms. So microbes were essential for the first mammals to emerge 200 million years ago, start doing amazing things like learning how to fly 13 million years ago, and ultimately 10 million years ago, microbes were responsible for the emergence of the branch of life currently represented by humans. Microbes continue to sustain the habitability of Earth for organisms like ourselves, by catalyzing chemical reactions within global biogeochemical cycles. For example, microbes take molecular nitrogen from the air, which is inaccessible to other organisms, and turn it into ammonia, nitrates, and nitrites, which 
other organisms can then use to synthesize essential molecules like their DNA and proteins. Another example is ocean microbes, which are responsible for the uptake of a large fraction of the CO2 produced by humans, which they use to support ocean food webs and also just generally balance CO2 levels in the atmosphere, making them a key factor in climate change models. And on an individual basis, microbes are a part of each and every one of us. There are approximately 1 trillion microbial cells in and on your body, the same number as there are human cells. The microbial cells living in the human body are collectively called the human microbiota, whereas the human microbiome refers to human microbial ecosystems. So this encompasses not only the microbiota and the microbes themselves, but also their interactions with one another and their environment and the molecules that they produce. The human microbiome is critical to human health, specifically in the gastrointestinal tract where the majority of the human microbiota resides. For example, the gut microbiome influences the maturation and regulation of the adaptive immune system. It helps protect us from infection by pathogenic microbes. It's involved in the synthesis of vitamins and neurotransmitters, and it influences our metabolism, even influencing our ability to uptake, uptake certain drugs. It makes sense then that disruptions to our microbiome might lead to a variety of different health issues. And indeed, scientists have found associations between microbial states and gastrointestinal, immunological, metabolic, and even neurodevelopmental diseases and disorders. The microbiome has been implicated in everything from inflammatory bowel disease to depression. And these associations have led to an explosion of interest, both scientifically and from the public, in the human gut microbiome. You might have seen some headlines like these in the news. What's troubling, though, is that despite all of this interest and hype, we don't actually know whether or not the majority of the associations between gut microbiome states and health and disease are causal, and we definitely don't know the mechanistic basis behind most of these associations. This is largely due to the challenges in studying the, human, com the complex human gut ecosystem. Human populations themselves are incredibly complex and diverse with so many different and changing lifestyles making well-controlled studies difficult. To get around this, many researchers use mouse model systems to study the human gut microbiota where germ-free mice are conventionalized with specific taxa or consortia of microbes that were isolated from humans and put into these mice prior to study. However, these are still simplified systems that don't capture all of the complex intramicrobe and microbe host interactions present in natural gut environments. So the findings from these experiments don't always translate very well to humans. These challenges have left room to examine some fundamental questions in human gut microbial ecology with great importance to human health. For example, what does a healthy microbiome look like? We know that many of the diseases associated with the microbiome show a lack of biodiversity um, in unhealthy people, but are there particular microbes or microbial functions that are characteristic of health or disease? What forces determine microbial community composition in the microbiome? Um, are there governing principles that can explain the differences in healthy and unhealthy people's microbiome compositions? And ultimately, can we modulate the gut microbiome to change the microbial community composition in a controlled way that is beneficial to human health? The current poster child for gut microbiota modulation is currently fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT. FMT is the process of transferring a donor's stool, or poop, into a recipient's GI tract, or gut. This is actually one of the most effective microbial therapeutics because it actually has a 90% success rate for the treatment of refractory Clostridium difficile infection that doesn't respond to antibiotics. And during my PhD, I realized that FMT actually offers additional opportunities to answer some of the fundamental questions in gut microbial ecology that I just mentioned by providing a model system that falls in between the extremes of complex but difficult to control human populations and well-controlled but simplified animal models. FMT effectively collides donor and recipient gut microbial communities together in a chaotic way in an already perturbed gut ecosystem. And this provides the ideal conditions to observe microbial colonization, succession, competition, and resilience in the human gut.
So to take advantage of this fantastic model system, we designed our own FMT study. We designed this study with Dr. Thomas Louie at the University of Chicago, Dr. Bana Jabri at UChicago, and a former postdoc in our lab, Dr. Sunny Lee. Dr. Louie is a clinician who performs FMT on patients suffering from recurrent C. diff infection. So from him, we received longitudinal stool samples from multiple FMT donors and recipients. Here's a timeline of all of the stool samples that we received from Dr. Louie. As you can see, we have two FMT donors, donor A and donor B, and five recipients of each donor's stool. Every single circle on this graph represents a time point from which we have a stool sample. You can see that for our donors, we have stool samples spanning periods of about one and a half to two years. And for each recipient, we have stool samples from pre-FMT, which is before this little red line, and post-FMT with a follow-up period of usually almost one year. So the first goal that we had with this data was to track FMT donor microbes in recipient guts to see whether or not they were colonizing after transplantation. And to do this, we first reconstructed donor microbial genomes from the microbial DNA in donor stool samples. So within each stool sample, there are a bunch of microbial cells from the human microbiota. We extracted all of the DNA from each stool sample and sequenced it to get metagenomes of each stool sample. This is just the sequence of all of the DNA that was in this, in this sample. So it includes the DNA of a whole bunch of different organisms. However, because of the way that sequencing is done, these sequences are fragmented into short pieces called short reads. And we don't know which short reads belong to which microbial genome, because in real life, microbes and their sequences don't have corresponding colors. So to reconstruct genomes from short read metagenomes, we first pooled all of the short reads from a single donor together and used an assembly algorithm to stitch these short reads together into longer contiguous sequences called contigs. We then mapped the original short reads from each sample onto the contigs in a process called read recruitment. Then using differential coverage of contigs across different samples and genomic signatures within each contig, we were able to bin these contigs um, into their original bacterial genomes. And these are called metagenome assembled genomes or mags, but I'll just be referring to them as bacterial genomes. That's all you really need to know. So this read recruitment to our contigs is useful for binning, but it also tells us if a contig or a particular genome was present in a particular stool sample. And this allows us to track FMT donor derived microbial genomes in our recipients. So this is what that looks like. Here, every single column is one of 128 microbial genomes that we derived from donor A's stool. And every row here is a different donor A stool sample metagenome. The intensity of the color represents the detection of a particular microbial genome in a particular sample. As you can see here, each donor derived genome is detected in at least one donor sample, which makes sense because as I said previously, these genomes are derived from the DNA present in these samples. But what we really want to see is if these donor populations are being transferred to recipients after FMT. So now in red, these two rows represent two pre-FMT samples that we have for one of the recipients of donor A's stool. And again, the intensity of the red color represents the detection of a particular genome in a particular sample. You can see that very few of these donor A genomes are present in this recipient before FMT. But after FMT, when we look at these post-FMT samples in blue, we see that many more of the donor genomes are now being detected in the recipients implying that these donor populations may be colonizing the recipient. And I can show you this data um, for all of these genomes and all of the recipients pre and post FMT, and you see this similar pattern occurring where for the most part, uh, donor genomes are absent pre FMT and then appear post FMT, implying that colonization is happening. But you can also see that not all of these donor genomes are as good at colonizing the recipients as others. I've added some additional information here and it's a little complex, but the main thing that I wanna show you for later is at the bottom here, this is the fraction of healthy adult Canadian guts in which we were able to, to, to detect each of our donor genomes. We did this using publicly available data and you can see that in this cohort of healthy Canadians, 
not all of our donor genomes are evenly prevalent. We also have this information for many other countries, um, and I'll bring up that geographic data again a few times throughout this presentation. And finally, here is the exact same figure, but this time this is for the genomes that we derive from donor B um, and donor B's recipients. And again, you can see that there's this pattern of donor um, microbial genomes not being present pre-FMT and then showing up post-FMT, implying likely colonization. We then set out to explain why some FMT donor microbes colonize recipient guts when others do not. To this end, the first question we needed to address was, is colonization outcome driven by neutral or adaptive forces? And what I mean by that is, if colonization after FMT is driven by neutral forces, we would expect the successful colonizers to be the most abundant in the donor stool sample used for transplantation. Basically, colonization would be dose dependent, where the more of a microbe that you put into a recipient, the more likely it is to colonize that environment. And that's just because the more abundant microbes would be the most likely to survive the bottleneck effect that occurs when a portion of a donor's stool is selected for transplantation in the first place, and also more likely to survive the effects of ecological drift in the recipient gut. This is sort of the most basic null hypothesis for how colonization could work. On the other hand, if colonization success is driven by adaptive forces, we would expect the successful colonizers to, do, to be the populations which are the most fit in the gut environment or the most well-adapted or well-suited to the gut environment. So two previous FMT studies actually did model colonization outcome and concluded that colonization was dose dependent, implying that neutral forces play a large role in colonization outcome. But we wanted to see if this was also true for our own data because our data set was quite different from those two previous studies because we had many more long-term post-FMT follow-up samples. So we first tested whether colonization was dose dependent in our data from donor A and their recipients. And these analyses were also performed with supervision and guidance um, from Mike Yu, who is a research assistant professor at the Toyota Technical Institute in Chicago. So we found that in donor A, the dose of a microbe as measured by its coverage in the transplanted stool sample was indeed um, correlated with colonization success. And we did this using a logistic regression model. So to further evaluate our model, we created an ROC curve, which is a curve of the sensitivity or true positive rate um, over the one minus specificity or the false positive rate of our model at all different probability thresholds. All you really need to understand is that a really good model would have an area under the curve or AUC of one, and a really bad model would have an AUC of 0 0.5. So our logistic regression model predicting colonization using dose has an AUC of 0 0.73, indicating that it's an acceptable model for predicting colonization and further supporting a role of dose and neutral forces in colonization outcome. However, we performed the same analysis, this time asking if colonization was fitness dependent in donor A, and we measured fitness using the prevalence of a microbial genome in healthy adult guts. And again, we actually found that fitness was also a significant predictor of colonization outcome with an AUC of 0 0.76. But when we created a logistic regression model that considered both dose and fitness together, the AUC was only 0 0.82 which is greater than the AUC of either of the two individual models, but not by very much. And one of the things that this could mean is actually that dose and fitness might be correlated within our data, which would make it very difficult to tease apart which of these variables contributes more to colonization outcome. And indeed, in donor A, the dose and fitness of a microbial population have a quite small but significant correlation with one another. So how then can we tease apart whether dose or fitness or both are driving colonization outcome? Fortunately, we had a second donor and in donor B and their recipients, dose and fitness were not correlated at all. And when we tested to see if dose predicted colonization success, we found that it did not, whereas fitness of a microbial population did indeed predict colonization success with an AUC of 0.7, indicating 
that colonization is dose dependent, uh, sorry, indicating that colonization is dependent on adaptive forces in this case and is not influenced by dose. So these results show that adaptive ecological forces are likely the primary drivers of colonization outcome and that fitness in the gut environment is as measured by the prevalence of a population in healthy adult guts is an important predictor of colonization success. Having established that colonization is not purely dose dependent and is driven more or less by adaptive forces, we then examine potential microbial functions that may be associated with colonization success and resilience independent of microbial taxonomy or species. So to this end, we first divided our microbial genomes into high fitness and low fitness groups. Our high fitness microbes or our high fitness genomes um, were those that were detected in all recipients of donor stool at least seven days post FMT, implying that they all either successfully colonized all recipients or all persisted throughout the FMT event. From these genomes, we then selected those that were the most prevalent amongst Canadian gut metagenomes, whereas our low fitness genomes were those that failed to colonize recipient guts or were not detected at least seven days post FMT in most recipients, and these were also on average much less prevalent than the high fitness genomes in every single country that we examined. Another intriguing observation was that our high fitness genomes on average were much larger than our low fitness genomes. So with this set of high and low fitness microbes, we were then able to compare the functional potential present in each set of genomes to see which features were common to the high fitness populations, which were more resilient and better able to colonize. So using a tool developed by Eva Vesely and Amy Willis and help from Jessica Fussel, we identified 33 functional pathways that were significantly more prevalent among the high fitness genomes than the low fitness genomes listed here. 79% of these pathways are related to biosynthesis compared to only 55% of the pathways in the database that we used showing an overrepresentation of biosynthetic functions. These pathways also include the biosynthesis of seven out of the nine essential amino acids and six of the seven B vitamins. So a pathway is a collection of different genes that all carry out a different step in sort of one functional module. So we wanted to see how complete these pathways were in our individual high fitness and low fitness genomes, where all of the genes in each of these pathways present. And this is a visualization of that. So here along the top in green, these are all of our, my goodness, these are all of our um, high fitness genomes. And then in red, we have all of our um, low fitness genomes. And then along the y-axis, of course, we have um, the 33 metabolic modules that were enriched in the high fitness microbes. And then the intensity of the color here represents the completion of each of these enriched metabolic pathways in each of the high and low fitness genomes. As you can see, these modules are much more present in the high fitness genomes, but some of them are also present in the low fitness genomes. But what's interesting is that when you compare the group of low fitness genomes that seems to contain these pathways with a group of high fitness genomes from the same phylum, so they're somewhat related, um, we actually found that these pathways are significantly less complete in the low fitness genomes compared to the high fitness genomes. So what does this mean? These results show that colonization and resilience are associated with the presence and completeness of metabolic pathways involved in the biosynthesis of essential metabolites. And this is a property that we've been referring to as metabolic competence. I wanna highlight what this metabolic competence looks like in the context of all of our high and low fitness genomes. What I'm showing you here is a box plot of all 33 metabolic modules that we found to be associated with high fitness. Each dot in this box plot is one of our 33 modules in one of our 20 high fitness genomes, and their completeness is shown on the y-axis. Um, the, these modules tend to be highly complete with a median of one, which makes a lot of sense because these are the modules that were enriched in these genomes. Whereas in our low fitness genomes, you can see that a large fraction of these modules are absent or incomplete. So how does this compare to genomes in other environments? 
Here I'm showing you the completion of these metabolic pathways in genomes reconstructed from the guts of healthy individuals. You can see now that these modules are more mixed in their completeness, where some of them are quite complete and others are not. But in genomes reconstructed from the guts of patients with different kinds of inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, a much larger fraction of, these geno of the modules in these genomes are complete. I can, this is sort of a combined um, data, but I can also show this to you on an individual basis uh, where the pattern also shows true. Healthy people's guts seem to have microbes with mixed completion of these high fitness pathways, whereas people with inflammation in their guts seem to have microbes that are enriched in the completeness of these pathways that are associated with high fitness. And when broken down by metabolic module, these implications become even more clear. Here, each line is a different individual um, whose genomes we used in this study. Um, and this is showing the fraction of the modules in that genome, the fraction of a particular module in that genome that were complete in those samples. As you can see, um, if you look at something like cobalamin biosynthesis, this pathway is generally much less complete in genomes from healthy people's guts um, and much more complete in genomes from inflamed people's guts. So this is a lot to take in. So to summarize, this is the pattern that we're seeing. Of all the microbes present in our donors, some successfully colonize all recipients after FMT, regardless of recipient lifestyle or genetics, and others do not. They fail to colonize most recipients. In the microbes that successfully colonize, we see that they are enriched in complete metabolic pathways for the biosynthesis of essential metabolites whereas the less successful colonizers are systematically missing these pathways or encode them only partially. If we look at these same metabolic modules in microbial genomes from healthy people's guts or the guts of people with IBD, we see that in healthy people's guts, there's a mixture of module completion, whereas in the guts of people with IBD, we see an enrichment in the completion of the modules associated with high fitness and metabolic competency. So what are the implications of this? When organisms like Bacteroides fragilis, for example, are seen to be associated with inflammation in the human gut, that's often considered to be a smoking gun, indicating that BFRAG is sort of a bad guy that must be causing that inflammation. And then we go and we try to figure out how BFRAG is causing disease. But our data show that high fitness populations, perhaps like BFRAG, might only be present in inflamed guts because they were able to survive, not because they've actually done anything wrong. And this presents an intriguing null hypothesis that we have named the Dark Knight Hypothesis after the 2008 Batman movie. So please bear with me. Um, but in the film, The Dark Knight, the protagonist Batman and one of the antagonists, Harvey Dent, AKA Two-Face, both fall off a building. Harvey Dent is killed and Batman is not because Batman's wearing all of his cool body armor. But after this incident, Batman ends up taking the blame for a lot of Harvey Dent's terrible deeds so that Harvey Dent can be remembered as the hero and symbol of hope that he once was. In this situation, Batman is a highly resilient individual who is essential to the city of Gotham's well being, but when he survives tremendous stress, he becomes a scapegoat for the tragedy that befell Gotham at the hands of others. Similarly, Microbes that are part of healthy human gut ecosystems that are selected for when a disease state causes great stress and perturbation of the microbiome could be mistakenly assumed to have a causal role in the disease. So our findings suggest that metabolically competent populations are associated with disease states because they are selected for by stressful gut environmental conditions and not necessarily because they are causative of disease. And this has several important implications. For example, it implies that a defining feature of healthy gut microbiomes is their ability to support a diverse community of microbes with a broad spectrum of metabolic competence. But even further, it also offers a testable null hypothesis that needs to be considered before we can come to a conclusion about a particular microbe causing disease. This also has serious implications for the development of microbial therapeutics like probiotics, because if host phenotype can cause an ecosystem scale response from the microbiome, we need to consider this additional challenge when attempting to change that ecosystem state by simply adding in additional microbes because they're associated with healthy people's guts. These microbes might not necessarily be able to survive under such conditions or modify those conditions just because they're usually associated with good health.
All of these findings that I've been telling you about were possible due to our high resolution metagenomic strategy that was able to distinguish between closely related populations of bacteria. And this is the highest resolution that's affordable today to characterize these dynamics in such a complex system. This contrasts with some common strategies that are used in the field that often can't distinguish microbial populations of the same genus, let alone species. So now I'd like to switch gears uh, to show you how important taxonomic resolution can be. Within the genomes we reconstructed, we identified three that belong to different species of bifidobacteria, which is a microbe that you're probably familiar with even if you don't recognize the name, because bifidobacteria are some of the most commonly used probiotics. Here I'm showing the detection in donor A and the recipients of donor A's stool of our three different bifidobacterium genomes. You can see that Bifidobacterium longum and Bifidobacterium adolescentis are pretty well represented in the donor samples and successfully colonize or persist in all five recipients of this donor's stool. Whereas this other Bifidobacteria species, B. lactis, is also quite well represented in donor A samples, but fails to colonize four out of five recipients. This is also reflected in the percentage of healthy Canadian gut metagenomes each of these populations is detected in, where B. longum and B. adolescentis are the most prevalent and B. lactis is the least prevalent. And this makes sense because um, this prevalence is associated with fitness, uh, which we know is associated with colonization and resilience in the gut. And this was actually true for every country that we looked at, except for Tanzania, where we didn't see any of these three populations at all. This was very interesting to me because of these three bifidobacterium, while many bifidobacteria are used in probiotics, B. lactis is actually the most commonly studied probiotic species. So it's so prevalent that when I was analyzing this data, I actually realized that I was simultaneously eating B. lactis in my yogurt. But more importantly, what is it that distinguishes B. longum and B. adolescentis from the worst colonizer, B. lactis? To answer this question, we compared functional annotations from KEG and COG databases between these three species by implementing a new ANVIO program that allows us to compare differentially occur occurring functions across a given set of genomes. And that's what I'm showing you here. And this data here is shown for the KEG functional annotations. Uh, I'll walk you through this, don't worry. Um, each concentric, concentric circle here is a different bifidobacterium genome. The slightly brighter layers represent the bifidobacterium genomes from our study, whereas all of the other layers are all of the complete bifidobacterium isolate genomes that were available on the NCBI at the time of this analysis. So the semicircles in red are all bifidobacterium lactis genomes. In blue, we have our B. adolescentis genomes. And in green, we have our B. longum genomes. And then each radii or sort of spoke of this semicircle is one of 954 different keg orthologs, basically gene functions that were identified in at least two of all of these genomes. And then a colored in area represents um, whether, an, uh, if an area is colored in, it means that a particular function was detected in a particular genome. So these functions are also ordered by their enrichment in these different groups. So this first slice here, these are all functions that were enriched in B. longum and B that were all enriched in B. longum, but absent in B. adolescentis and B. lactis. But the slice that we're most interested in um, is this one here. These are the genes, um, these are the functions that are enriched in B. longum and B. adolescentis, but absent in the worst colonizer, Bifidobacterium lactis. And these functions were actually very interesting. For example, these functions included the tetrahydrofolate and histidine biosynthesis pathways, which were two of the metabolic pathways that we had previously identified to be associated with high fitness, but we also identified a phosphoenol pyruvate phosphotransferase or PEP PTS system, which is involved in carbohydrate uptake and metabolism, multi-drug efflux systems, bile acid efflux systems, and genes involved in general acid resistance response. So not only do the differences in phenotype between bifidobacteria species show that colonization ability can't be predicted by genus level taxonomic information alone, but we also identified functions and pathways that might be critical to colonization success. And because in this case, our local colonization phenotype within our study was reflected by prevalence globally, 
the potential targets and hypotheses generated by these findings might also be relevant on a larger scale. And this really demonstrates the power of using metagenomics when combined with pangenomics, which is the word for this type of functional analysis. Metagenomic read recruitment allowed us to assign phenotypes to these different populations and get insight into their ecology, whereas pangenomics then allowed us to identify the genomic features associated with those, um, with those different phenotypes and lend insight into the evolution of these populations and their adaptation to the gut environment. So one of the main lessons from my PhD has been that combining complex data and integrative omics strategies like metagenomics and pangenomics together lends deeper insights into microbiomes. Ultimately, by reconstructing novel microbial genomes from individual gut metagenomes, we can reveal glimpses of the generalizable processes that govern the microbial ecology of the human gut microbiome. This strategy can also bridge the gap between omics computational studies and hypothesis testing by providing targets for mechanistic studies in real world systems to further untangle the forces driving microbial colonization and resilience in the human gut. And the insights that I was able to gather were not limited to what I've talked about today. Um, myself and our lab have used the formula that I'm showing you here to participate in a bunch of other studies that also investigated very different aspects of the microbiota in different environments. Which brings me to the broader applications of these techniques. In one example, we used read recruitment from publicly available gut metagenomes from three different countries to expand the context of a newly described mechanism for host microbe interactions and show its importance on a global scale. We also use genome resolved metagenomics to reconstruct genomes of a bacterial parasite that infects mosquito ovaries and pangenomics to then identify a completely novel plasmid and previously undescribed viral genes within that bacterial parasite. And this actually had really interesting implications for the potential future control of mosquito populations. And finally, in another collaboration, we again use genome resolved metagenomics and pangenomics to reconstruct microbial genomes from human oral cavity, plaque, and tongue samples and show that dental plaque and non-host environments actually resemble one another in a way that suggests that some clades of microbes may have actually used plaque as a stepping stone to adapt to a more host-associated lifestyle, for example, on the tongue. Finally, as I said previously, these findings and the findings in my dissertation would not have been possible without the integrated analysis of very large and very complicated microbial omics data sets. As a classically trained wet lab microbiologist initially joining this lab, when I began my PhD, my computational training was minimal and my experience with tools for the analysis of large omics data sets was pretty limited to those that function as black boxes sort of predefined workflows where you put in your data and they carry out many bioinformatics steps, but require little to no understanding of what those steps are actually doing. However, throughout my project, I was empowered by the use of the modular, well-documented and open source software, Anvio. Anvio allows microbiologists to ask their own questions of their data rather than confining their curiosity to pre-existing workflows that have become standard in the field. Not only was Anvio essential to my thesis work, but this work also informed the development of Anvio. There were features that I needed for my project, and I was able to work directly with Anvio developers to make them a reality. With that, I'd like to quickly make um, a few acknowledgments of the people and organizations without whom this would have been possible, would not have been possible. First, I'd like to thank my main collaborators on this project outside of the lab, Jessica Fussel, Christopher Quince, and Thomas Louie. I'd also like to thank my committee, Jean Chang, Bonna Jabri, Sam Light, and Howard Schumann for their invaluable feedback and support. And I'd like to specifically thank Fran, Noreen, and Natasha, who kept everything running and helped me so much these last five years. I'd also like to acknowledge my funding sources, the Muchnick Family Fund, the Duchess Wa Family Institute, the Gastrointestinal Research Foundation, and the Robert C. and Mary Jane Gallo Scholarship Fund. I'd also like to give an enormous thank you to all of the members of the Marin Lab, past and present. Each and every one of these people has helped me with my research in some way, and more importantly, they have been the most supportive, patient, hilarious, and kind group of people to work alongside. 
I can honestly say that my grad school experience improved a hundredfold the day I joined this lab, and I've always felt incredibly lucky to have convinced them to take me in. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Florian, who has helped me so much in the last couple of years specifically with writing my paper and figuring out how to frame this main project, and for somehow always knowing when I needed a pep talk or a cup of tea on the porch instead of writing advice. And of course, this amazing group of people would not have come together if it weren't for Marin, our fearless leader who has shown us that he's not afraid to literally risk his own life to take a good lab photo. I don't even know where to begin when it comes to thanking Marin, who has modeled in so many ways the kind of scientist and person that I aspire to be. I'm so grateful for his invaluable advice and mentorship and for his inexplicable faith in me, which has given me the confidence to achieve so much more than I ever thought would be possible. Thank you, Marin, for being the most supportive mentor imaginable and for always sticking up for the little guy because we appreciate it so much more than you could possibly know. I tried to break my acknowledgement section into or other smaller sections like lab and friends, but it was really honestly impossible because my lab mates, current and former, have been some of my best friends in grad school. And so I'd like to thank them for their friendship, for all the laughter, and for the endless encouragement whenever I thought I couldn't do something. Every scary presentation I got through was thanks to you guys, and you've just added so much joy and warmth to both my grad school career and also just my life in general.